The service of the service of lament remembering the victims of the Indian boarding schools and that will be at five o'clock here uh, in our uh, main sanctuary and um, we have sent this out to us sort of across the land um, so that people from all of different denominations um, will um, be aware of this and particularly here in the Washington County area. So if you are interested in joining us for that, uh, Father Everett has done a great job in creating the um, liturgy for that. It is, it is not Eucharist. Um, it's filled with all kinds of poetry and scripture and remembrances. So I invite you to join us for that. We will be having a Thanksgiving Eve service at, I think it's 7.30 on um, the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. This coming week, we're starting something brand new um, that's coming out of some creativity of our Gabriel Center, which is the, a friendship circle. Basically what it is for anyone over 55 um, to come on Thursday of this week from one to three, is that right? One to three? Um, and we're gonna play games and just have fun. And my hope is there's gonna to be tons of laughter, which I'm really into. So if you are over 55 and you wanna just come and enjoy um, fellowship with friends, um, that would be great. We would love to have you. There are other items um, available in this service leaf or in this um, messenger booklet. If you want to see it, that would be great. I would be happy to share it with you. The last thing I want to share with you is, you know, on the 31st of October, we did the culmination of our um, fall stewardship drive, our pledge drive. And I just want to give you a comparison of where we were a year ago in 2021 and where we are today. Um, this time last year, we had 60 um, pledge cards 18 of the pledge cards were, incre were increases, and the percentage of increase was 11.9%, and it totaled $184,002. That was in 2021, 421. This year, same time at the conclusion of the uh, drive, we have 74 um, pledges, pledge cards. The total of the pledges is $217,884. The number of pledges that increased were 30. That's pretty astounding. And the percentage of increase was 17.33%. So the congregation, and if you have not turned in your pledge card, please do so. Or if you need a pledge card, if you haven't, if you lost yours, or as I said, if the dog ate it, um, we have had a dog in our household that would eat anything. If it was on the floor, it was meant for her. So if you want to help with the work of this parish, we would love to have your, love to have your pledge. As you know, we are in the process of a search. And so that increases the cost of things. There are things that we need to pay for that are extraordinary, at least for this next year. So um, prayerfully consider how you want to be able to financially um, continue helping out here in this parish. We're going to now um, turn our attention to the lighting of our Advent wreath. So we will begin on page two. As our nights grow longer and our days grow short, we look on these earthly signs, light and green branches, and remember God's promise to our world. Christ, our light and our hope will come. Listen to the words of Ezekiel the prophet. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. Then you shall live in the land that I gave to your ancestors and you shall be my people and I will be your God.
Let us pray. O Lord, our God, you gave your law that righteousness might abound. Put it into our hearts to love justice for others as much as we desire it for ourselves, that as we know you to be our judge, so we may welcome your reign as it is manifested through Jesus Christ, our Savior, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be dominion and pray. Our service continues on page three of your service leaflet. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known. And from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear, hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Greetings, Mark. Greetings on First Samuel, Chapter One, Verse One. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife, Penina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severe, severely to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, 
she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Anna rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow. O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set before him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently, only her lips moved but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. For I have been speaking out of Israel, excuse me, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. And Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Could we get a little more volume, um, the microphone a little closer to you, Bill? So it's hard to hear. It's uh, very quiet. Thank you. I'll give this a try. <clears throat> the psalm this morning is from 1 Samuel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Anna prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in my victory. There is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken but the feeble, feeble gird on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry are fat with spoil. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness for not by might does one prevail. The Lord, his adversaries shall be shattered the Most High will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointing.
The second reading is from Hebrews. Every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sin. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies could be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, or after, saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart, full of assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. He came out of the temple. One of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what large stones and large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The gospel of the Lord. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Amen. So on a technical note, I have my lavalier mic off. I just want to see if everybody can hear me okay on this microphone. We're good? All right, thank you. Yeah, good call. How about on Zoom? We good on Zoom? Outstanding. Thank you all. We're good. Thank you. Recently, I've been thinking a lot of the late great improvisational comedian and actor Robin Williams. And I have it on good authority, we're allowed to dance at this part of my sermon if anybody wants to. Although much of the rest of the world remembers him for TV shows such as Mork and Mindy and movies including Dead Poets Society and Goodwill Hunting, 
In many Episcopal circles, at least the ones in which I run, he is also remembered as the member of our church who gave us his semi-famous top 10 reasons to be Episcopalian. These include, as some of you may recall, you don't have to check your brains at the door. And no matter what you believe, there's bound to be at least one other Episcopalian who agrees with you. It seems that Williams had some keen observations of our faith tradition. Today, because we're transitioning from one church season to another, I'd like to highlight another one of Williams's top 10 reasons. The church year is color-coded. Different occasions in church are marked by specific colors called liturgical colors because they're connected to our liturgy, our worship. So these colors connect to either the occasion of the specific service or the broader context of the season in the church year. And they are reflected in the color of the vestments that clergy wear, as well as select fabrics in the chancel, the area here around the altar. For example, white is the color of Jesus's burial garments. And we use white for Christmas, Easter, and other feasts or festival days, as well as marriages and funerals. Purple or violet are frequently used for Advent or Lent. Of course, we have the optional alternative use of blue for Advent in this congregation and many others. Red is used in Holy Week, the day of Pentecost, and in ordinations. And as Father Everett mentioned in his sermon last week, our parish is observing an optional expanded Advent. This means that we're beginning our season of preparation before the beginning of our national post Thanksgiving shopping rush, while we still have a little time to breathe, to be still, to prepare ourselves for God's arrival. For the larger Western church, we're at the end of the season after Pentecost, which runs from the late spring into November. This season is part of what we call ordinary time, which also includes the season after Epiphany, coming up after the end of this Christmas season in January and running um, to the start of Lent, which happens uh, every year sometime in February or March. And of course, this, this time is marked by green. As with many words in the church context, ordinary takes on a special meaning. In this case, not commonplace, but rather referring to the Latin word ordinalis, referring to numbers in a series. This is also the predecessor to the English word order, and it marks the long span of the church year in which we focus on walking with Jesus in our day-to-day -day lives. So the church year runs from the beginning of Advent to the end of the season after Pentecost. Some of you may have noticed designation of years A, B, and C, which reflects our lectionary or scheduled scripture readings for Sundays and church holidays, which is on a three-year cycle. With gospel readings in year A, focused on Matthew, year B, which we're wrapping up now, on Mark, and year C on Luke. And the gospel of John is read across all years for particular special observances. Today, we near the end of year B, which we'll conclude in a week with Christ the King Sunday and a gospel reading from John. Thus, we come to the end of our gospel readings from Mark, which we started almost a year ago with the end of chapter 13, the beginning of which I just proclaimed before this sermon. Mark is probably the oldest gospel. It's also the shortest, making for an often fast paced book. Mark's themes include the coming kingdom of God. And yet, Jesus' disciples and we along with them are often clueless. We can see all this in play in today's reading. For a few sentences right at the beginning, Jesus is exiting the temple and predicting its destruction. Then the next sentence, we find him a 30-minute walk away, the next hill over, the Mount of Olives, apparently with just four of his disciples, Peter, James, John, and Andrew who are mystified at this prediction of destruction and how it might fit in with the coming of God's kingdom. Jesus's reply is both frightening and mysterious. Keep watch, he tells them. 
so that they may be they may avoid being led astray there'll be people falsely claiming to speak for me and there will be all manifestations of wars between kingdoms and nations there will be earthquakes there will be famines manifestations of wars between kingdoms and nations seem to be a tragic hallmark of human existence as a veteran myself of both the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard preaching a few days after Veterans Day, I imagine that I share with most of you, including my fellow veterans, a degree of abhorrence at the aspect of human nature that seeks to dominate and exploit other people, that selfishly attempts to place oneself at the center of the universe. We can believe Jesus' warnings against people falsely attempting to speak for God and that there are disasters to come because we have already witnessed these things. But this is not the end of the story. In fact, it is a kind of beginning. These calamities are, Jesus tells us, labor pains that signal the coming arrival of the reign of God on earth. Jesus' use of this image seems to me to be an important reminder, both that God is not gendered and then in the face of human violence, God creates life and gives love in abundance. In our current Markan narrative, if we pull back a bit to see the larger picture, Jesus is nearing the end of his earthly ministry. He has been all over Galilee teaching and healing and ultimately has come to the Jerusalem area to be tried and crucified. The triumphal entry to Jerusalem, which we mark as Palm Sunday, has already happened. Jesus and his disciples have spent a few days moving back and forth between Jerusalem and Bethany, where Martha, Mary, and Lazarus live. And today they have come to Jerusalem again, where in the temple, Jesus has repeatedly been questioned by the leaders and scholars of the Jewish community. A bit before today's reading from Mark, Jesus interacts with a scribe whom Jesus tells he's not far from identifying the hallmarks of the kingdom of God. This is rather striking since in today's reading, Jesus has told us that there will be events that signal it's coming. Jesus and this scribe agreed that the greatest commandment is to love God with all our hearts, souls, minds, and strength. And that second commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves. He then essentially illustrates this by pointing out the destitute widow who gives all she has to the temple. As Everett mentioned in his sermon last week, she is loving God and her neighbors with all she has and is. And yet today we find ourselves in a somewhat unsettling point in this book. Jesus has asserted his authority and taught about key aspects of the kingdom of God, but he has also told us that there are difficult times ahead before the kingdom will come and that more has yet to be revealed. This theme signaling the transition into Advent is already part of the lectionary. It also fits well with the expanded Advent that we're now observing. In Advent, we prepare ourselves for two different ways in which we know God to be coming. In one way, we're preparing for the birth of the baby Jesus. And on another level, we prepare for the arrival of the kingdom of God and Jesus' second coming. Although much smaller in the grand scheme of things than Jesus' arrival, this particular Advent year, we as a congregation also happen to be anticipating the arrival of our new rector. For me, this additional layer of waiting as a community brings a heightened sense of how to make the most out of this Advent time of preparation. Although aware that much has yet to be revealed, we know that Jesus is coming to us both as a helpless infant and as a triumphant king come to save the world. We know that Jesus has taught us to love God with everything that we have and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we trust that God will connect us with a rector with whom 
we will seek renewed ways of living God's gospel teaching a love for God and neighbor. The invitation is to live today into faith practices that help us in this preparation as individuals and as a faith community. As individuals being especially attentive to love of God and neighbor, we can be open to ways in which the spirit is guiding us through such means as our daily prayer. And in the love and reconciliation we share with family, friends, and community. And as the people of St. Gabriel, in addition to everything else, we are learning how to resume worship with many of us in person, while many of us still remain on Zoom as well. In some cases, we're picking back up ways we did things before. But in many cases, we're finding that we need to work together in creativity and love to discern new ways of being church. I'd like to leave you with a final idea that I think asp uh, addresses the, these aspects of both individual and faith community ministry in this time and place. In both aspects of our faith journeys, I can think of no finer prayer than the prayer attributed to St. Francis, that famous deacon, which you can find in the Book of Common Prayer on page 833. And if you don't have one at home, I think we can arrange for you to get one that you can take home. Let us pray. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Amen. May we stand together and join in the articles of our faith as we recite the Nicene Creed found on page six of your service leaflet or on page 326 in the prayer book. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten one being with the Father, through him and for the past spirit, he became Mary and was made known. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the Lord and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our service continues with the prayers of the people which you can find on page seven in your service bulletin or on page 328 of the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ Church and the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word hast taught us to make prayers and supplications, 
and to give thanks for all people. Receive these, our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. In the Anglican cycle of prayer today, we pray for the Anglican Church of Australia. And in our diocese, we pray for St. Paul, Oregon City, All Saints, and Ascension, Portland. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, our diocesan bishop, Diana Akiyama, for our parish clergy, Canon Linda, Father Everett, Deacon Tom, Deacon Roger, and Deacon Greg, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We pray for our community, that all of St. Gabriel will be a resource to our neighbors. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, especially Joe, our president, and Kate, our governor, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Please join me in praying aloud for those in immediate need of prayer by bold name. Jenny and John, Tim and Nelda, Virginia, the Utter and Doggett families, Mother Luann, Bill, Justin, Amy and Henry, Sally, Bliss, Zoe, Patrick, Tyler, Rod, Ellie, Jenny, Kate, Brent and family, Werner, Ginger, the Stoller and Senate families, Christine, John, Ray, Darlene, Deacon Catherine, Tom, Ed, George, Ellen, and Dave, are there others? Bob. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, especially George Gillespie, Bob Doggett, Sharon Rosati, the Reverend Catherine Phillips, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service and to grant us grace, so to follow the good examples of St. Gabriel and all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Are there others? For Chuck. Please, huh? Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved thee with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. 
for the sake of thy son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways to the glory of thy name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. And I say to all of you, wherever you may be, the peace of Christ be always with you. And with thy spirit. Peace, everybody. May we continue now with the prayer for our search process. Let us pray. Holy One, open our hearts and minds that we may discern your will. Grant us patience and perseverance as we wonder and wait for the one whom you send. We pray for a new rector who will help us embody the deep unbounded love of Christ that is alive in our parish and community. Help the search committee to listen and respond with wisdom and gratitude each step of the way. Amen. Amen. And I invite you to join me as we pray for our search committee. We pray for God's wisdom and guidance for Joan, Ginger, Polly, Tom, Tim, Ian, and George. And now for our birthdays and anniversaries and thanksgivings, we are praying for birthdays for Rich and Adeline, Larry, John, Wedge, Paige, and Patrick. I know that Paige is around here someplace, but maybe we'll catch her at the 10 o'clock service. She's busy getting ready for Sunday school. So let's see, uh, anyone on either on Zoom or in the sanctuary who's having a birthday that we did not list. Let's play together for these folks. Watch over your children, O oh Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And then for anniversary for Leslie and Bill, Bill Kidd, do we have any others who are celebrating an anniversary? Let us pray. O oh God, who has so consecrated the state of matrimony that in it is represented the spiritual marriage and unity betwixt Christ and his church, look mercifully upon these thy servants that they may love, honor, and cherish each other, and so live together in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing, of peace. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. I appeal to you, friends, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Amen.
our service continues on page 333 of the prayer book or on page nine of your service leaflet. Will you please stand? The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is meet and right so to do. It is very neat, right, in our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty everlasting God, creator of the light and source of life, who has made us in thine image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord most high. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All glory be to thee, almighty God, our heavenly Father. For that thou of thy tender mercy didst give thine only son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink, drink ye all of this. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, According to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts, which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all of the benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, our bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction and made one body with him that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy, through our manifold sins, to offer to thee any sacrifice. Yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom 
in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia, O Lamb of God that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God that takest away the sins of the world, grant us thy peace. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. You are now invited into a special time of communion as we open our hearts to the abundant grace of Jesus Christ in these times when we cannot be physically present to one another. We remember that Christ is always present to us, connecting us one to the other. In the mystical body of Christ, which knows no bounds of space or time. We will be, I will be coming to you to present to you, um, to offer to you um, the wafer. If you will just simply um, hold out your hand, I will bring it to you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, 
We most heartily thank thee for that thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of our Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members and corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee in the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, and keep you now and always. Amen. That's what's from here, Priscilla.